Welcome to a brand new episode of Today's Entrepreneur by FL Montreal. I'm Dan Delmar and my co-host Michael Newton returns next episode. Josh Miller joins me in a moment. You can now hear us on the radio in our new time slot Saturdays at noon on Montreal's News Talk leader, CJAD 800, and we'll also be publishing new podcast episodes as we create them. You can subscribe to the show by heading to the iHeartRadio app, iTunes, or your favorite podcast platform and searching Today's Entrepreneur by FL Montreal. Our archive of a decade's worth of shows is still at todaysentrepreneur.org. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business, presented by FL Montreal. Dan Delmar and guest co-host Josh Miller with you, in for Michael Newton of FL Montreal. Welcome back, Josh. Hello, Dan. Ah, nice to hear that hello again. So um, we were, of course, together on the show for, what, 11 years now, and um, you did move on. And we're going to talk about moving on a little bit in a sec. Um, we're going to speak to some entrepreneurs uh, who are very well known in Montreal. 1642, they make tonics and drinks and all kinds of stuff locally, uh, employing over 400 people. So they are our profile this evening on Today's Entrepreneur. And later in the show, trustee Patrick Sullivan joins us. To talk about dealing with the banks during this very difficult time and insolvency this year versus last. How patient are your banks and how best to communicate with them? So first, how's it going, Josh? How has your uh, you know, pandemic been? Uh, pandemic's been, of course, very interesting. I'm actually in quarantine because I had a, a business trip to the U.S. and now uh, following the rules as uh, as we all should from uh, from from to keep to keep this pandemic low uh, and hopefully minimize it or eliminate it soon. Uh, so it's it's been an interesting year. There's no question dealing with people working remotely, uh, dealing with uh, the inefficiency of that. Uh, but the world still turns, and uh, and you got to adapt where you have to adapt. I noticed you passed your one year anniversary, um, you know, at uh, at MHG Rockland. Now you're someone who spent their entire career at one place with Michael Newton side by side at at FL. How do you feel about that transition? And in your case, obviously, the transition wasn't you know urgent as as it's been for so many people in the last year. But what advice would you give for people that may find themselves, uh, you know, overhauling their life's work? I would say, don't get stuck on looking back. Look forward. Uh, you know, there's there's so much knowledge that you may have gained in your existing job or career that no doubt will apply to the next step. That no doubt can bring a different perspective to where you go next. And I think it's a little bit exciting because you're you're taking knowledge that you've applied in a certain situation and taking it to a brand new set of circumstances, different people, a uh, different uh, sector or industry. And it's, it's, you know, while there is a scary factor to it, no doubt, uh, I would say the exciting factor, the excitement factor is that much more. And it's, it's amazing what kind of, what kind of feeling you can get when you change and you start something fresh and new versus somewhere where, I was there for 30 years, so it was quite a long time. But even if you're there for a few years, everything is still uh, can be very exciting, very new. Just don't be afraid. Don't look back. And of course, you know, one of the reasons I changed because it was a very difficult decision was I didn't necessarily want a regret, a regret. And I definitely don't have one. And it's been uh, it's been quite a ride to change careers during the pandemic, I must say. I'm sure it is. And uh, speaking of, you know, refreshing and, um, you know, rejuvenating, I, I want to talk about um, this, uh, this trend. It's called a SPAC and it's a new way to invest. And it's all the rage for 2021, especially at the higher levels. Josh, what is a SPAC? Well, SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company. And while it might be all the rage for 2021, it was all the rage in 2020 and it has been around for quite a number of years. Uh, five, six years or so. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's a, how can I put it? It's basically, it's a company that goes as, acts as an IPO. So goes onto an IPO, but then is there to buy other companies. So it, it's almost as if, uh, if you didn't want to get into an IPO, if you didn't want your company to get in, uh, you can approach a SPAC, which is, call it a special private equity type firm that is listed on, on, on a stock exchange and you can actually sell your shares to them and become part of that SPAC, part of that special purpose acquisition company. Like everything else, 
you know, it's you, you get on the open market, there is a risk. There are certain special rules with SPACs. So your downside risk actually is, is limited to a certain degree. But at the end of the day, it's still speculative. And like a mutual fund or private equity or, or, or some type of pooled fund, it really boils down to who's leading that group, who's leading that fund. Where are the, where's their expertise and where do they want to look to invest your money? Let's end with um, cybersecurity. I actually had a bit of a data breach situation uh, today. Actually, I, I installed a, an extension on my browser that was uh, bought by apparently, and without me knowing, but by an unscrupulous party. So I had to undo that. That was about a 45 minutes of my day, actually. 45 minutes uh, that I lost today for, for what we used to call twiddle this week in data loss. That's right. And I, I would say cybersecurity is probably one of the number one issues that uh, that we were that we needed to deal with uh, certainly in the, my current position, uh, and that's because th there are so many factors. First of all, everything is run, all the data. You know, every as we go more paperless, we really have to be concerned about the backup of our data. But because we have a lot of unscrupulous people out there, combined with the fact that we have a tremendous amount of people working remotely that don't necessarily have high security levels in their own home and connections to the office, the internet, uh, which is a, a huge opening for all the, all the ransomware people that want to come in and attack. This has become uh, an issue that is absolutely huge. And entrepreneurs, if you're not, if you haven't dealt with it, you're already behind. But I mean, there's, there's so many different effects to it between teaching your, your own people what to look for, what not to look for, the phishing, the spear phishing, uh, you know, phishing is one thing. Everybody sees these mass emails. Spear phishing is when they kind of, you know, glamp on to an existing email that they found in your system and take over that email chain as if you're talking to that same person. So it's, it's as if you're feeling that you're right at home with your supplier and then all of a sudden they're suggesting things and you might be directing money elsewhere. Uh, you know, you can insure against it. There is cyber insurance, but that too is an interesting avenue because Usually they have sublimits. Usually there's, you can have a great million dollar policy, but it doesn't mean that if you got fished, then, you know, maybe there would only be a $50,000 sublimit to that policy. So you really have to, you know, I would say cyber insurance can be very useful and very important. Certainly with, you know, if you have to give uh, pay ransom, that being said, read the fine print because just because you have a million dollar policy doesn't mean it covers a million dollars of everything. So it's really there's a, there's a lot to, there's a lot to do, but I would say educating your people, uh, educating the team, and having the right security software in place, it's got to be near the top of the list. And let's go to a company that um, well I've I've been a customer of for quite some time. They make delicious beverages. Sixteen forty two, uh, named after the the year Montreal was founded. Joining us is uh, the, are the founders Bastien Poulain and Melanie Mamet. Bastien and Melanie, welcome to CJD. Hello, hello. Josh, uh, you know, I, I, with the simplest question. First. I do. I do. Notwithstanding the fact that you called me old, I'll, I'll, st I'll still jump in right now. Thank <laughs> you. Man. And really, the, really the, the easiest question, uh, just to make sure our listeners understand exactly what you do, Bastien, Melanie, what exactly is 1642? What do you bring to the market? Uh, hello, everyone. So, yeah, we, um, we started in 2015. Uh, so already six years and uh, what we do in, in life we're producing here in Montreal uh, mixer premium mixers and tonics like uh, tonic water ginger beer uh, to do exceptional cocktails I know it's the 28 days of uh, dry February <laughs> but you can do mocktails also uh, and we started in 2015 with a cola with a maple syrup cola and now uh, we have uh, three products and soon five. <laughs> we're going to talk about it maybe later. Uh, and we're distributed um, across Canada in Ontario, uh, BC and uh, Quebec, of, of course. Now, were either of you in this business beforehand? Like, why get into this business? What were you doing before? I, I will let my uh, associate answer that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as you as you can hear, uh, I'm from France and I moved uh, to Montreal uh, seven years ago. 
and uh, I studied in finance and accounting. And before before 1642, uh, I worked for Club Med, so I traveled a lot. Uh, but I, I, I worked uh, in finance. And uh, I met Bastien maybe uh, six months after uh, my arrival in Montreal. But I used to work in the finance department uh, before 1642. And Bastien, and, what were you doing before? <laughs> and me, I'm the sales and marketing guy. Um, I used to. Uh, I moved to. Uh, I moved to Montreal 12 years ago, and I used to work in the hotel business industry. I was a marketing director, sales and marketing director for two hotels in Montreal. And I think what we have in common with Melanie, we we love uh, local producer, local uh, local product and that's why uh, I started the company and she joined me very quickly after uh, I started the company. So without having any specific knowledge in the beverage field, how do you learn that? How do you get into that? Do you do you study on your <laughs> own? Do you bring in an expert? Like like it's something completely different than what you were doing before. How do you get that knowledge? Uh, I think it's um yeah, it was difficult because uh, I didn't know anything about beverage, uh, food industry, uh, margin in, in those industry. And uh, I think it was a, a process, a, a step-by-step process. Uh, I was lucky enough to be, uh, to be surrounded with uh, intelligent people <laughs> and to have uh, expertise in that, in that uh, market. So um, we learned a lot with Melanie, uh, with, you know, when you deal with the Sobeys, with you, when you deal with Metro, it's big, big companies and, uh, and, and you want to be taken uh, as seriously as uh, your competition. So uh, you need to, to learn fast. And uh, I think the, the process of, of learning is, is by uh, being surrounded with the uh, expertise, uh, that's just like that. That maybe Melanie, you 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 want to add something else? No, I, I agree with that. It's true that we we didn't know anything about the about this market, but we learned and we we're still learning. And so we we worked with the right people, and uh, you we learn. I think uh, very fast. But what at the beginning, it's a, you want to bring something on the market, and so you you just uh, you jump. <laughs> When you when you walk in, when you're dealing, because distribution has got to be one of the key issues in your business. If there's no distribution, you can make the best product, but if nobody's going to be able to taste it, then what's the point? So when you're when you're just coming out of, you know, you're you're new to this game and you're you're going to find distribution channels, walking into big, big box stores like a Sobeys or whatever. How do you what like what are the lessons that you've learned? How did you make it happen? Or is it just a question of paying for shelf space? Mm. <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, when, when I began uh, the company, it was in January 2015, minus 15 outside, and you want to sell a good maple syrup cola, and people are, are watching you like you're crazy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I tried the best I, I could to make the, the space on the shelf. You know, with my, uh, my, my, my job before, I was the sales and marketing guy. So I was able to sell rooms in a hotel. So for me, it was like um, candy to have my own product to sell. So, um, you know, we uh, in 2015 we uh, we opened a lot of uh, independent stores and we had we have been lucky enough to to have some visibility and that's that's why maybe Dan uh, know us from a long time uh, we we have been able to participate to uh, dans l'oeil du dragon on uh, on radio canada and that gave us a lot of visibility and give us also the space on the shelf because when you have visibility people are asking you for your product in the stores and the grocery manager finally decide to put your product on on the shelf but you still have to pay for it at the beginning not really but uh, as more as you grow <laughs> it's not uh, you know life is not uh, is not free <laughs> so uh, you have to yeah you have to pay for the shelf 
I wanted to ask you about the cola because I did fall in love with the cola. It was like a gateway product that made me fall in love with your tonic as well that we use with the, with our gin. Uh, it's actually downstairs, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> the cola, I'm a maple syrup freak. So I was instantly attracted to the terroir aspect. Um, I actually kind of drank too much of it. Like I, I, I don't drink too much, too many sweet drinks, but I had too much, went back to find it in the supermarket and, and it went away. So what's the story with the cola? What, what happened there? So that's true that the, the cola, it was the first product of the company. So it, it, it launched the, the brand of 1642. But after two years and a half, maybe we realized that the market were uh, decreasing. And so uh, the sales were not so good as the beginning. So we had a look on the market and it's true that uh, all the um, all the uh, beverage with the sugar, even sugar is natural. It's not a, it's not a, a trendy market. And uh, in, in the same year, in uh, 2015, we launched a tonic water. And uh, at the beginning, it was not, uh, it was not good. Uh, sales were not so good. But after two years, uh, it, uh, it began to, to, to increase a lot. And so uh, we decided uh, to move to a, a new, not really a new market, but a different market. Like we, we won't be in a beverage, mar a beverage or sparkling beverage, but uh, we, we, we wanted to move on the tonic and the mixers premium. So you're looking ahead, you have the tonic water. Tell me about that pivot, pick up where we left off. We, we, we had pivoting in 2017, if I'm not mis mistaken. Uh, you know, at the beginning on the, on the labels, we had uh, historic personnages. So we had uh, De Maison Neuve, we had Jeanne Mans, and you know, people were not, um, they were not able to, to see the link between the, the beverage, a sparkling beverage company and the history. So we decided to rebrand the, to rebrand the, the logo and all the label, but also to move to another market. As, as Melanie said, um, we decided to move to the premium mixer market and to stop all the, um, uh, all the, 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 the soft drink that you can have during your lunch, for example. So we moved to the cocktails and mocktails industry and we're very happy about that decision. We're launching two new products and two tonics. We're launching uh, an elderflower tonic water and we're also uh, launching a uh, light tonic water. So 25% uh, less of sugar, natural sugar, uh, and uh, it's still very tasty and very good. Is it difficult to come up with all these recipes? Is there a lot of trial and error? What, what's, what's that process like? And do you do it yourself? We don't do recipe uh, in our kitchen. Uh, we worked very closely with, uh, with a specialist, with a chemist. And so uh, after uh, five years now, he, 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 he teached uh, to us uh, how, how we have to, to think about a new product. So we work, uh, we work very closely with him. And uh, we, we, we make some tests, uh, we, we taste. So for the, the two new tonics, uh, we, we drank some gin tonic at nine in the morning <laughs> because it's better in the morning if you, want, if you really want to taste uh, the, the products. And so- I'll and have to we, keep that in mind. We, I'll have to keep we, that in mind. Good tasting okay. in the morning. Yeah, yeah good, it's taste. good tasting. It's, it's, a, it's the best day, in, it's, it's the best moment in the day. Uh, to taste all the, the flavor. Do you feel it's important, like with, with the recipes that you develop, do you feel it's important to protect those recipes like intellectual property? Uh, or is it really, you know what, uh, I just have to make sure that it's the right brand, that people like it and, and I'm first to market? <laughs> You know, it, it's it's cool that you you uh, you asking that because um, when the when I first met the the, the chemist in two thousand thirteen, um, and I was the idea of the maple syrup cola, uh, I asked him. Is it easy to do a Coca-Cola recipe? And uh, he told me, yes, it's really easy. It's really easy to do a good cola that could taste the same as the, the red and the blue brands. But the big difference is uh, their distribution and the brand. Uh, it's, it's, 
easy to copy, but so difficult to to market the product when you have multinational like that on the market. So you would say that your your branding is and your your marketing is even more important than the recipe because the recipe is easily reverse engineered. Mm, yeah. Exa exactly, you you can you can do the same recipe, but uh, what makes a difference is uh, is everything about brand and marketing and the and the storytelling. Mm. So when you're when we're talking about branding and getting getting people to know that brand 1642 that you know Dan has been drinking for many years, uh, and and I have no doubt that the audience will start drinking going forward if they haven't already. Is there? A, did you do any campaigns to get out there that that worked, or maybe maybe you can share one that didn't work? <laughs> I, I will let uh, Bastien, who, who is uh, <laughs> the specialist guy of, of marketing in sixteen forty two. There's a there's so many mistakes we did uh, during those six years, uh, so we wouldn't have enough time to talk about that. But um, yeah, to to make people aware that you live you you have <laughs> a product on the market it's really really difficult so what we uh, in in the first years what what we try to do is to do more uh, pr public relation and to um, we spoke a lot to journalists for the uh, about the impact of buying local of supporting 400 jobs in, in montreal and we were a little bit david against Goliath. So that makes a good story uh, in the news. Um, after that, for the mistakes that we did, <laughs> uh, we did two crowdfunding campaign. Um, all those platforms that uh, give you advice on it's going to be uh, very cool and you, you will be uh, everywhere and everybody's going to talk about your product. It's not true. Uh, they're taking a, a a bigger percentage of the amount that you, you're, you're crowdfunding. But at the end, uh, it's not that uh, huge in terms of marketing. So I would not recommend to do it. Sorry for uh, for those platforms, but uh, that's what that would be my advice. Me neither, by the way. And I, I do PR uh, during the day. And uh, and I have to say that those channels are often you know very problematic for brands. And PR is also, now that I think about it, how I actually came to your product as well. I'm pretty sure it was an article in La Presse or something. Um, tell us about the, the social mission. Was that was that key to selling the story? The fact that you are terroir, that you're taking Quebec products, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and and do you think you could uh, you could go further with that mission? You know, like Coke, Coke and Pepsi don't brag about their terroir. You know, is there any room for 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 that kind of vibe in 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 the United States to expand? It's not really about terroir, but about uh, local uh, lo local industry and local product. And uh, at the beginning, 1642. It has been created to offer good products, but to offer local products and to support local business. So it was uh, with uh, maple syrup because the maple syrup is a uh, is a big hit uh, in Quebec. But it, it was really uh, since the beginning the, the the idea of 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 local products was uh, was so um, so important for us, and it's still important. And uh, local doesn't. Uh, always means that just uh, from Montreal, but you, uh, now local for us is also with partnership, and that's what we do in Ontario. That we have some part, some uh, some partnership with uh, with local distillery, but in Ontario. Just before we, uh, I know we're we're running out of time, but just quickly, I know I know for entrepreneurs when they're dealing when they're dealing production and they they don't always do it themselves. Sometimes they have strategic alliances and and subcontract it out, which I believe you've done over your years. What would be the the kind of a little bit of advice or what's worked for you when you've selected that right strategic alliance or strategic partner to help put your product out there to manufacture it? Hmm. Um, I think when you, you, you're doing co-packing, like what we do right now, um, it's really important that uh, the two companies are as the, the same values. Uh, you want to go in the same direction. And if you don't see any uh, values that you share, uh, stay away from that co-packer. Uh, so uh, when, we, uh, when we decided to, uh, because we changed three times of plants uh, during those six years with Melanie every time we're we have big meetings at the beginning and we're 
or challenging the values because uh, you, you can't go further if you don't share those values. We'll have Bestia and Melanie's one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur on the way. And up next, Patrick Sullivan speaks about dealing with the banks in these fraught times, about credit, about insolvency and more. Patrick Sullivan, welcome back, sir. Always a pleasure, guys. First, I, I think the good news generally is the banks, Canadian banks have actually been quite patient with, with entrepreneurs this year. Well, let me give you a little bit of history of what happened in 2020. Uh, when the COVID hit and all of a sudden everything came to a stop, there was a, a, a huge panic, obviously, in, in the financial community as to how they were going to deal with it. Uh, the insolvency professionals were clapping their hands like I was saying, hey, guys, we're going to have a tsunami of files. It's going to be unreal. Well, the end result is just the opposite, because with all the government subsidies that, that were put in place, uh, statistic-wise, insolvency in 2020 went down, generally speaking for commercial insolvencies, by about 23%. Consumer side went down 33%. So it goes without saying that what happened is government subsidies, low interest rates, and the tolerance of the bankers uh, really came into play uh, in order to, you know, sort of alleviate what we had expected to happen. Josh, uh, so what happened here? Is this government stepping in, telling the banks what to do, or are we just blessed with really kind bankers? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think it's just the kind bankers, uh, although I know many of them and they are pretty kind. But I think there's a couple of factors. I think definitely the government programs that have come in have helped significantly. Uh, and I do believe that the bankers are also, you know, pull a plug on a company during a pandemic and it's really bad PR. So do you, do you stretch out the, 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 the parts of the ratios and understand and have a little bit uh, more elastic way to, to deal with matters? I think that's an aspect too. But there's no question. People are spending less in their companies uh, because of certain things. Not all companies. I'm generalizing. Uh, and there's some extra money that's come in. If you've gotten subsidies, whether it's a wage subsidy program from a company standpoint or a SERB personally, uh, you know, it's certain, and, you, and you're spending a little less, so it's all going in that same direction. But Patrick, I, I would imagine that, that I mean, the, the banks still have to watch the companies. They still have to keep an eye on them. Absolutely. What's happened a lot in 2020, and it's still on, an ongoing thing, Many companies that were faced with uh, struggling cash flow, uh, obviously ratios that were not being met. As you were saying, the bankers have a social responsibility. We're not going to pull the plug on anybody. But what we are going to instigate is what, in, in the bankers' terms, we call it a forbearance agreement, where we will reopen the dwellings we have with a client the contracts we have with them, we're going to look at the ratios because in many situations, they're out of line. So we're going to revisit the whole banking process with that client in order to sort of help them. Uh, so we're going to forbear certain things, but we're also going to ask that the company does things in return, uh, namely more reporting. Uh, they're going to be faced with sometimes an, an external consultant to go in, you know, and provide them with help. Uh, and there's a number of things they may ask for additional collateral uh, in order to keep supporting. So there's been a huge amount of work that's been done in terms of preparing these agreements. And they always have a, 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 a beginning and an end. So they're put into place for either three months, six months. Now we're looking at forbearance agreements, which are basically going to 18 months. So basically what bankers are doing is they're, they're foreseeing what's coming. So uh, they're pushing everything ahead and giving more opportunities to companies to, you know, stay alive. Uh, and I, I think that's their purpose. And I, and I think, yes, there's definitely a high level of tolerance that is not going to be, it's not going to be forever. So people got to get their ducks in a row. But I would, I would just finish with the fact that entrepreneurs that are out there that are wondering if their customers are going to be in business tomorrow, I would say, keep your eyes open, Mr. And Mrs. Entrepreneur, because there is a wall coming. So maintain your cash flow, maintain your connections with your customers and suppliers, and don't lose out on that surprise bankruptcy down the road. 
Exactly. Thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, always, always informative. Always a pleasure, guys. And as we approach the last moment of our show, as, uh, as we do each week for the past many years, mm -hmm. 11 plus years, uh, we'll turn to our, to our entrepreneur guests and ask you, Bastien, Melanie, what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? So what I learned during these six years is stay focused on what's in your hands and take a deep breath about what it's not. And don't forget to drink a gin tonic sometime to, to relax about everything. <laughs> Whether it's at nine in the morning or nine at night. <laughs> and on, on my hand, I would say um, like a, a piece of, of advice uh, in terms of sales, um, 90% of the time people say no to me, uh, they're closing doors. And um, I learned in those six years that uh, sometimes to go through the windows, it works pretty well. So, uh, so don't give up. Uh, I mean, it's not easy to start a business in the food industry, uh, but don't give up. There's a, there's a place for new, uh, new product and there's a place for new challengers. So come with us. It's really fun to work in the food industry. Thank you, Bastien. Thank you, Melanie. And Dan, just before we conclude, my one takeaway, and it did come out a little bit, but I can't emphasize it enough, and we've seen it on so many programs before, the ability to pivot, the ability to realize when a product isn't working and switch to something that could, that could definitely change and improve from there. Don't be afraid. Pivoting is key in any entrepreneurial aspect. Bastien Poulet, Melanie and Mamet from 1642. Uh, best of luck with, with the new products tomorrow, which are going to be in stores, by the way, the new tonic waters. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget to head over to todaysentrepreneur.org. You can listen to the, the podcast and past shows there. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you back here soon. This has been a production of TNKR Media. Good talk.